Dr. John Bennett from Boston Medical uh, TV. We have another in a series of Boston Medical Hangouts. Uh, tonight we have the pleasure of having Chris Daly uh, from Datu Health. He's out in Boulder, Colorado at a convention. Uh, also joining us tonight is John Hewitt, a medical writer from Philadelphia. Um, tonight, uh, Chris is going to tell us about big data uh, and why some of the big players in healthcare uh, really don't want to use it. Uh, as well as some other related topics. So, uh, good evening, John, and good evening, Chris. It's all yours. All right. Am I? Is this me? Am I good? Yes, you're good. Sweet. All right. Well, hello, everyone. So, yeah, let's talk about big data a little bit. And 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 there's kind of this dichotomy, John. You know, going on right now. Doctor John, can I call you Doctor John? Sure. All right, man. So. Um, Big data has this great promise, and uh, a lot of us detractors kind of point at it not being a transactional system on the technical speak, right? And so we're not going to get technical here. But let me tell you a few of the decision points that come up in governance committees at hospitals. As you know, I, I was the interim C chief technology officer at a uh, uh, $5 billion IDN out of, out of Orange County uh, to help them with their vision. So I'm very familiar with the decision-making processes that the hospitals are going through. In addition, to the decisions and the, the pressures being placed on them, not only by regulations and legislation, but by the, the vendors of the software themselves. And so this, this, is, this is what's going on, basically. Big data has um, this great promise. You look at uh, the leaders of our country business-wise that, that used to be companies like Ford and GM, right, and, and, and these, these other major corporations, but today we're being led by companies like Facebook and eBay and Microsoft and Google and Amazon. And every single one of those companies has learned and created mantras around how to manipulate data and turn it into valuable information using big data technology. And it's things that relational databases can't do. It's things that legacy databases that a lot of the healthcare systems rely on cannot do. And, and it, it comes down to this basic mantra that you need to store now and structure later, right? If you can store now and structure later, you skip this whole process of trying to figure out the data before you store it. And that saves you tons of time and money. And then what that gives you is data agility, so you can start materializing the data in data marts and doing all kinds of fancy things, whether it's things like Intermountain and partners are doing by, by creating uh, care programs or mobile applications and innovating around it. So why, why aren't they, all of healthcare you know, uh, providers and, and payers as well, why aren't they leveraging this technology? I'll tell you why. A lot of these legacy platforms were built uh, based on 1960s technology that evolved over the years, and we're in the fifth or sixth generation of this technology that's based on months. It's a database technology that goes into big iron. So when the Affordable Care Act came along, and, and I, I'm a big fan of the Affordable Care Act. It's necessary uh, for us to have this. It doesn't matter if it's Obama. It didn't matter if we had a Republican uh, as president. We needed to do this as a nation to, to fix the health system. Not that it doesn't have a lot of rough cuts, but um, what it has done, it has forced all the healthcare systems to buy electronic health records, and they're terrible for doctors. Horrible user experience. It takes time out of your day. You bring a filthy laptop into the emergency, into the into the exam room. You type on it with the electronic health record, and the next thing you do is you ask your patient to open up and go ah, right. So let's talk hospital acquired infections. The number one cause: you didn't wash your hands. So we've got all these things coming on here, right? Um, but the thing is, big data doesn't lend itself to what these legacy vendors are doing. They're making money hand over fist, selling what they're calling post-relational databases, but they're just the same old horse and wagon. So how do we fix this? And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what some of the healthcare systems I'm working with are doing, as well as Day 2 Health. Uh, and this is Boulder, Colorado. Is, um, I'm at the Boulderado today. This is actually our headquarters, not the Boulderado, but the city, Boulder, uh, Colorado. And, and, and it, 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 it's being able to get all the data, store it now and structure it later, and that lets you everyone jam on it. And in healthcare, they kind of avoided that. And, and a lot of the CIOs kind of say, if everyone's jamming on the data, this is personal health information, man. You can't just let everyone jam on the data. It's got to be protected. There's HIPAA regulations. There's a high tech act. You know, there's all kinds of ONC certifications for, uh, around meaningful use and attestation. But, but the truth is this. PHI, let me, let me, let me, let me give you the this rejoinder back on the PHI concept. Any data that you share in the course of care is PHI. If I tell you my shoe size, if I give you my Twitter handle to my doctor, it is PHI, which is the reason more and more things are becoming PHI. So as we begin to use big data and, and we, we create these care platforms, right, where we're driving toward patient engagement, we're driving toward population health, 
uh, goals and capabilities. What we what we end up doing is 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 forcing ourselves down an old path and not a new path. So let me give you the solution. I don't I I I might be skipping a few steps here, but let me let me, let me talk a little bit about about what we can do. And <clears throat> let me start just by saying a lot of us are focusing on patient engagement because meaningful use those are dollars. They're very readily available. All the vendors are selling toward meaningful use, and, and so that means that you know a testing for meaningful use phase one, phase two. Do you have a patient record? Can you view, transmit, and download your record? Can you send an email to your doctor? Can you look at your problem list? Can you look at your allergy list? Look what you just did with the regulation. You turned the entire healthcare software industry uh, into pursuing what's considered the floor, the basement, the minimum capabilities, what meaningful use was always meant to be. Not the ceiling. There's no star players who just achieved meaningful use. It's supposed to be what, you're, what you should be able to do. And so every software vendor is targeting this because by achieving the minimum, the government's giving out these handouts to the healthcare systems, right? None of this technology is new, and all of them are focusing basically on getting that ONC certification and selling you basically their platform. And they're very good at selling it. They have ends in every single healthcare system, uh, political, you know, they have cash, they're lobbying, they're, they're um, having a, an impact on the regulations themselves. Now let's look at population health. And this, this is where we can actually turn the corner and we can do some good. Population health has, as one of its tenets, patient engagement. And if you look at the New England Health, uh, the New England, uh, health Consortium's uh, patient uh, engagement framework, right, it's, it's meaningful use. Phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, do you have a patient portal? Can you engage? Can I insert information? Can I communicate that information to another healthcare system? This, this, is, this is basically not engaging. This is logging into a, to, to, to like ADP to look at my payroll, right? I want to log into my clinical record. I'm, it is kind of cool. I can email my doctor. But most of us spend one hour a year talking to our doctors. We spend 52 hours a year, right, looking up health information for us or for our family members online. So there's that great gap. Population health, if you're really pursuing it, then you're, you're, you need to stratify the riskiest patients into population segments. And a great way to do that the begin is one that healthcare systems already have, and that's by using algorithms that allow you to stratify patients based on health risk assessments, right? But that's not the end of it, and this is where big data comes into play. As you begin to create care programs that target those populations, you find yourself constricted in what you can do with that data, with the healthcare data, because these electronic health records have very old and clunky analytic systems. As you're trying to pull meaningful data out of these, um, this, these are more like business intelligence engines you find that you really can't do population health. And this is where jamming on the data can do really cool stuff. By storing it now and structuring it later, I can do something like show your chief medical officer, or let's call it, let's create a new clinical. Let's say we're going to do a population health manager up, up, up top and a care manager down here. And the care manager has cohorts of people in programs. One program might be for diabetes. Another program might be for pregnancy. Another program might be for employee wellness if your healthcare system is selling to uh, companies that are big enough to do that, right? Well, each one of these care programs has elements. Let's say your diabetes program is a great use case here. Uh, let's say your diabetes program has an element of it, right? A pedicure for everyone who has type 2 diabetes. Is it worth paying for? Well, the, the impetus behind that might be any week that they're not properly managing their diabetes or the sugar or their like, glucose levels. You could tell pretty quickly if you're trained to do so by looking at their toes because their toes are one place where, where the disease uh, uh, emerges and you can you can notice there's problems. So to prevent unnecessary amputations and spend less money, it's actually less expensive to buy those patients a pedicure every week. And it's not something we often think about. Right? I'm gonna go to my my PCP, Dr. John. Um, I'm here for my pedicure. Well, okay, so I won't go to Dr. John, but but a, but a nurse or someone. Mm -hmm. And the metrics we can get back from this, you're very familiar with these metrics, but we're not applying them to the personal health system. And the metrics. You know, structural, procedural, and outcome metrics, right? The structural metrics being how many doctors in my healthcare system actually can prescribe one of these program elements. The procedural metrics being how many patients that could be part of a program actually have been come enrolled into a program to help them out uh, where they need help to, to, to live better, have better quality of life. And of course, the outcome metrics of those patients that have been enrolled in one of these program elements. Uh, how many are having positive outcomes versus negative outcomes? By collecting those metrics, I am able to tell you what's worth paying for and this menu of options as part of a care program. Right? Like I said, diabetes, pregnancy. But here's the brilliance of big data. You're used to those metrics, right? Let's yeah. add in personal trackers. Let's add in nutrition logging. What's on your Fitbit? What's on your Nike Fuel Band? Right? What's on your Apple iWatch, right? You're tracking your heart rate, how often you're exercising. 
And let's start looking at those metrics and do the same thing in a care program. Ah, now that data has suddenly become PHI. And the immediate response, and, and uh, uh, John Halaka up in Beth Israel uh, is, is actually investigating this as well as my company, Day2. Uh, how, how can we turn that under-consumed personal health data, you know, what used to be a thermometer in your bathroom, but now it's this, this tracker that we're all wearing, and it's, it's all this digital information that we're generating. Let's turn that data into a quantified self, the patient days I'm sure you're all familiar with. Well, we can do structural, procedural, and outcome metrics on that data, and the way you do it is this. Every one of your care programs gets classified as a clinical research program. By doing so, all of the data that was PHI and you were afraid to share with someone who might be sounding like a marketer, like it's, it's targeted marketing, think about it, right? I want to segment a population and figure out how to get content to them and, and nudges and nudge them in the right direction. This is marketing. It's been figured out in every other industry. No new technology here, very easy to do. Um, so I can show you a dashboard now. Today, I can show you a dashboard that basically says, here is uh, the patients that you are um, at capitation or at risk for in, in your geographic region to a population health manager. They, um, I've been working with uh, St. Joseph out in LA. Say this, you know, um, Southern California has one of the worst uh, uh, di diabetic populations in America, according to the studies. Well, I can show you that um, I, can, I can add in your tracking information, how much you're walking, I can add in how much you're exercising. I can look at how much uh, you know carbs and fats you're eating, and I, I can do the same thing. We can create a program that says you need to eat right. You need to collaborate with your family. I can put you in a cohort with people similar to you and incentivize around it. And then I can show you a report that says of these program elements, these are the things that are working for this ethnic group. These are the things that are that are not working for this other ethnic group. These are the things that are working for this age group. These are the things that thing work. You know, let's say Latinos between 20 and 40. That pedicure program element works wonderful for it, but it doesn't work for Asians between 40 and 60. Hmm. Well, now your population health manager can look at that, re-stratify the risky patients and say, for those Asians between 40 and 60 who are also type 2 diabetic, we need a different kind of program instead of that one. And you can tweak it and optimize it like a control panel, and now you can look at this nice, beautiful chart and graph that basically says, these are the patients that you need to talk to to help them spend less money on health care to prevent them from having catastrophic encounters in the future. That's what big data can get you. It is a holy grail of population health management, and it is more of a ceiling than the basement of patient engagement or meaningful use. Hmm. I have a, a quick question. Uh, one thing you, you probably will soon mention uh, would be genetics. Uh, you know, you're, you're talking about splitting up data according to gender, race, um, age, and then you're talking about intake, uh, food, alcohol, caffeine. If the patient has 23andMe data, for example, and they have a certain problem metabolizing caffeine, you can check their cytochrome P450 enzymes right there, see if they have sickle cell, that, that kind of thing. Where, where do you see that fitting in to this whole scheme of big data? So this, this is the other great thing about, about big data is it opens up for your clinical researcher researchers under the aegis of population health management the ability to explore that data in uh, at least two ways that address exactly what you're talking about. One of them is I can create facets. So I can, I can drill into the populations. I can, I can have one particular patient that has that, and I can go find other patients historically that have also had that challenge. Then I can apply, apply time series pattern matching. And this, this is beautiful, it's predictive analytics. I can say, of the patients that are presented similarly, right, this is actually a very quick report to run, big data. of patients who have, who have presented similarly, these are the tests that were done, and these are the drugs that they were put on. And maybe, maybe there's, there's three different treatment options that were used, and maybe because it falls outside of the evidence-based guidelines, right? Um, I can then show you if there's enough patients, a cone of probability of whether they're going down or whether they're going to go up based on the treatment regime. So you're able to create new evidence-based patterns around that. The other thing I can do with big data systems is I can do computational mining around it to do optimization routines. And that's, that's a fancy way of basically saying I can mine the data. I can look for emerging patterns and discover things that are going on that might be that, that, that can help me identify those patients in advance before they come uh, come to me. But that's, I mean, that's a really great question. As we begin to talk about uh, genetics and proteomics, you know, um, 
we open up the sci-fi textbooks, right? We begin talking about Gattaca, about the possibility of, of, of discriminating on, on the, the, the profiling of people based on what their potentialities are for disease. And a lot of people, when they hear risk stratification, that's immediately who comes to mind, right? Oh man, you're going to stratify the risk. I'm going to get put in the risky group. People are going to realize I'm expensive. And like that, uh, that, uh, that guy in New Zealand that got kicked out of the country for being overweight, I'm afraid that's going to happen to me. I don't want to get kicked out of the country. Um, so there's definitely a plethora, you know, a myriad number of um, uh, discrimination type ethical, bioethical issues around using big data. But as long as you are actually improving the health of the community and targeting population health, um, the goal is to not misuse this data. So obviously you have to have the, the regulations and controls in place to do this uh, so that it's not misused. But we are on a, our, our, our health system platform, I would say, is on fire. It's on fire while we're trying to rebuild it. And so this is just part of the effort to kind of be more intelligent about how we apply healthcare uh, technology in the future. And, and as much as I like the intention of the Affordable Care Act and the intention of the meaningful use, uh, they pulled us down a, a path that doesn't, it doesn't innovate. It, encourage, it actually disencourages innovation. You know, one question, uh, Chris. Uh, thank you. You said a lot. Um, my favorite book is Eric Topol's Creative Destruction of uh, Medicine. I love that book. That's what got me onto the damn computer. <laughs> what was uh, he gave me hope actually, and a lot of things he said, uh, and much in, in the same vein as your population medicine. He talks about personalized medicine and how a patient, different patients are affected by the same drug. Much as you said, the populations may be affected differently by the pedicures. Is population medicine the same as personalized medicine? Is that? Uh, I would say one encapsulates the other. I would say population medicine, as I call it. Yeah. You know, if I, if I talk about how new forms of, of targeted populations of, of ascribing medicine toward identified population sets could create new outcomes for communities. I would say that the population medicine mindset can encapsulate personalized medicine in this way. Um, you know, personalized medicine takes your genome and basically says, based on your genome, these medications will work better for you. And these other medications probably won't work so well. And it's allowed us to do things like targeted antibiotics um, instead of using spread spectrum antibiotics for certain kinds of diseases and, and issues out there. Uh, certainly, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm actually, a, I love uh, that book, Eric Topol. Um, actually, uh, we actually had him speak for Day 2 Health on at least one occasion uh, because we, d by definition, we just we are here to disrupt. But to disrupt in a way that doesn't come out and say, you know, I, I learned early on a couple decades ago, the absolute worst thing you could do in, a, in, a, in healthcare is uh, walk into a healthcare system and be disruptive in a manner that makes it sound like they're doing the wrong thing. Right. You, know, you, you don't want to come out and say, Hey, guess what? You guys are stupid. You need yeah. to do it this way. But yeah. to work together towards that goal, to have someone pick up a torch based on ideas that and, and, you know, information and research that you can provide them with, and then to actually achieve that together, I found is one of the greatest, greatest uh, feelings in the world. Okay, John, you got a question? Yeah, you, you mentioned um, monitoring, say, autism, Parkinson's, Huntington's. Something like that seems to require a dedicated surveillance system, Google Glass or some kind of a camera system to be tied in for constant data collection. I mean, something a little bit more beyond the Fitbit. Um, how would you foresee feeding the databases with, with this data if everybody doesn't have their own Google Glass available? So one of these great things about population health, what I call, or, or what we kind of refer to as experiences, is that it does allow you to incentivize and uh, subsidize where necessary when it's going to cost you less money to do so. So when it gets down to telemonitoring and biomedical devices or clinical grade devices for telemonitoring versus ones that are just consumer grade devices, and we're bringing together personal health information with clinical documentation to create what, kind of what I call an enriched patient record, which is more there, right? So when, to, to get at that information, there are systems that today, and well, a lot of them are, are forthcoming, actually. They're on Indiegogo and Kickstarter, and there's a lot of great ideas out there, so will they evolve? I can tell you at least there's at least two products right now that you don't actually need to wear. Uh, they're not Google Glass or anything like that. You kind of put them in the corner of your room, kind of, kind of like a camera. And what it does is it gives you telemetry uh, on the person or the person around you 
um, without actually them wearing it. Dis well, the Walt Disney Corporation invented this stuff 30 years ago. It's called fairy dust. It allows you to monitor people as they're walking around to, to basically you can tell um, who's got a, a high heart rate, you know, and stuff. It's just the basic information. So there's mm -hmm. there's things that can monitor you without being on your body. There's things you can wear on your person that can monitor you. And there's tons of creative minds getting at that, right? So one example I would give is, is for depression. It's kind of tricky to monitor, but uh, there's programs out there that basically we can monitor your GPS, you know, if you opt in or if your family convinces you to opt in and you, you admit that you need help with this. Um, what, you know, people who are depressed before they have, before they have an encounter at a hospital and, and get admi admitted quite often stop answering the texts, or stop replying to texts that they normally do. They stop answering the phone calls that they normally take. They lock themselves in their home and they don't leave for several days, right? And so these are actually things that are very simple to monitor and it doesn't take a person. It's not actually that creepy. It's just a very basic algorithm to say, hey, um, we're, we're going to nudge. The, we're going to nudge the care manager now. We're not going to nudge the person. We're going to nudge the person and say, "Hey, is everything okay?" Kind of automatically. But we're going to nudge the care manager to reach out to him and say, "Hey, man, you haven't left. Uh, and uh, you're part of the, you know, part of this monitoring program. What's going on? You know, what can, what can we do? Or, or, or whatever they, they say to help to 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 engage with you to uh, to help you make you feel better. So those technologies, there are some amazing technologies right now. You know, coming out. To specifically address what you're talking about about the telemonitoring aspect, um, right. and I would say that companies like Aetna uh, have what they call an experimental reimbursement phase, where they, they take these telemonitoring devices and they try to figure out if it's worth reimbursing for. Uh, we need to be better at that, and that's part of what I was talking about in the population health program. If you can figure out what elements of the program are worth paying for, then you can create new forms of evidence-based medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, Chris, I, I just get the impression when I listen to you that there's a kind of a log jam in the system, uh, and there's an inefficiency at, uh, of interpreting all this wonderful data we're generating. Is that is that correct in my my thinking there? Is it this kind of a log jam or a blockage somewhere? Yeah, yeah, I would say we are drowning in a sea of data that we cannot turn into information. And the sooner that we can take advantage of this technology called big data. Yeah. We can start discovering what in other industries is called dark data. We can emergent patterns that we haven't identified. In other industries, it's a gold mine. Gold, it's, uh, it, it's also a gold mine in healthcare. But by the way, it saves lives. Hmm. Yeah, I'm wondering the, the simple things. You know, I'm not talking about glucose or measuring metabolites, but just heart rate, temperature, blood oxygenation, blood pressure. Maybe uh, selfie cam monitoring pupil size. That's all just just big data. Now, if you have some more intelligent programs, not not to call it artificial intelligence, but something that says, hey, we, we noticed the heart beats up, but your temperature's down and your blood oxygen is down. So just like a little bit more complicated than a flow chart to predict, give you a range of possible things that might be going on. Is it something that you should um, stop and take a look at, call your doctor? Is there any program out there that is good at that already? Like I would call it differential reading of, of simple vitals. Big time, big time. So this does exist in other industries, but it hasn't been tailored for healthcare yet. Let me give you an example. Um, every year in San Diego County, the Santa Ana winds come in. And when the Santa Ana winds come in, they bring with them all the smog that was trapped out there. And so could you correlate that with the uh, asthma encounters, right? So matching up data from weather and your, your own health records in your healthcare system to kind of figure out, hey, guess what? I just found a population that we could target and do something about the next time we know that the Santa Ana winds are coming in. Uh, being able to correlate data that wasn't connected. So, for example, I can tell you, you know, if you walk over 7,000 steps a day, right, uh, your blood pressure will be better managed. Okay, and the only way I could show you that chart is if I'm creating that enriched patient record experience where I'm basically grabbing your tracking information through an aggregator. Maybe it's, maybe it's a human API or a folytic or Health Kit, or uh, AT, I can go down the list. Uh, AT&T has an M Health platform. Uh, uh, Samsung has SAMI. Verizon has the, the Converged Health platform. Uh, everyone's coming out with these platforms that are supposed to to bring all the data together. But the big one that we that we think about, the big, I'll say the big two, is uh, Apple's Health Kit and Google Fit. Right? So how are you going to use those ecosystems? Right? Yeah, I and mean, this is big time. I love this stuff. Um, I mash the data up the way it's connect dots that have never been connected before. And we can all be healthier. Hmm. You know, Chris, um, 
Uh, is there any other industries that more effectively uses big data? That, and if so, uh, is healthcare trying to kind of copy them or, or try to emulate what they do? Uh, obviously, retail. You, you guys remember that story from uh, uh, two years ago in February when Target uh, got that nasty gram from the father uh, who basically said, why are you sending my daughter pregnancy ads? Right? Okay. right. Remember, and it was because her buying patterns changed. She started buying uh, uh, um, those little cotton balls and, yeah. and buy free stuff and uh, send free stuff. And Target looked at this buying pattern using big data algorithms and basically said, hmm, people who generally do that, we have a pattern here. You know what? This might be a pregnant woman. We're going to start sending her pregnant ads. Well, nine months later, the father sent Target an apology saying, apparently, there were events in my household I was unaware of. <laughs> <laughs> It's creepy, right? Isn't it? I mean, it's like, man, That's good. It's like big, it feels like Big Brother. So who do you want to be? If you're going to have a Big Brother that you trust, can there be a Big Brother that you trust first? But would it be a payer? Would it be a provider? Would it be the government? Would it be your PCP? Or is it your family? Can you create a care circle with your family? Or like over in Britain, where we have district nurses. Let's say we had district nurses in America, and, and let's call them care managers in place of that. Could you trust a, a care manager? that had access to that level of information about you, who maybe was watching all the different metrics and big data come in to say, oh my goodness, you know what? You know what I'm seeing here based on your last blood test as well, in addition to your buying patterns and what you've been putting in your food log? You may be, you might have hyperuricemia. I, let's get you in here because I think you might have gouty arthropathy, right? Right. And, and, and how many people, and that, that's one disease in particular, that, 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 that the people I know who, who, who suffer from it the first time, they have no idea what's going on, and they think they're dying. Mm -hmm. They go in the hospital, and they get an x-ray, and, and there's nothing. There's nothing, because these little acid crystals in your blood, they don't show up on the x-ray. And they're like, mm -hmm. but I feel like my own body won't support its own weight. Um, and when they find out what it is, and they get on something like allopurinol, and it's cheap, and it's managed, uh, uh, and it costs like $7 a month for the, for the prescription, they're back to their life. And, and they're good, but there was this traumatic, depressing episode that could have been prevented and probably predicted if only that big data was available to someone who would have mined it for their own good. You mentioned the Google Fit platform. I, I heard it just came out this week. I haven't had a chance to look at it or anything, uh, but I posted an article today on Extreme Tech about Google X and this fellow, uh, Andrew Conrad, his new project to create a wristband that monitors magnetic particles that are circulating in your bloodstream, binding to everything from potassium to whole cancer cell epitopes. Now it's like a five-year program, and there's no FDA approval for anything like this. But I'm just wondering if that's going to be something that they're going to Google uh, will integrate in with their FIT platform or create something entirely new, or, or what, what is your knowledge of that? Uh, I, I I can either confirm or deny whether or not I know anything about that particular platform. What I and, and I, I do. So so let, let me let me let me just say that I believe that that kind of um, initiative is going to fall into their their uh, their their relationship with you know the age pursuit that they have, the wellness. Let's call it longevity or autonomy, the ability to live That's longer, to a more approach to health. To not let age defeat you, to not struggle when you're dying, but to 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 die peacefully. You know, to have a better full you know full verse of your life as opposed to we all just kind of get to the end and spend two million dollars in a hospital. Uh, and 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 that you know for some people that's necessary, but many people wouldn't choose that. So I would say this platform will probably become part of Google Fit, but there's other things uh, that that will become part of Google Fit much sooner. Um, but Google's also, let me, let me just couch that by saying Google has recently, uh, to my knowledge, rediscovered a desire to engage the healthcare, you know, the healthcare system after Google Health, if you remember Google Health, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and that has a lot to do with all of the providers signing BAAs and figuring out how to basically couch the legalities of working with PHI. So I think first you're going to see a lot more of these health trackers these uh, more common things like glucose monitors and blood pressure monitors and things like that. And then you're going to start seeing Google go off off the deep end with a lot of this stuff, like you said, the magnetic particles. There are actually uh, companies out there that are, that are setting up those particles. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a nano project that uses the, the, the magnetism to attract particles. And then um, 
you can you can pull it out of the blood to, to kind of clean it. And there's also another um, gosh, what is the name of that company? There's a mo they came out like a couple weeks ago. You might you might remember the the mobile dialysis machine. No yeah, more, that you wear around your waist. Yeah, no more sitting in a clinic. Tell me how great that is for people who've been sitting in a clinic for dialysis. Yeah, oh. that looked like a really great design. Um, I think they use that in India now. You mean like the portal or peritoneal dialysis type thing? Or totally different? This looked like a construction man's tool belt that you wear. Oh, okay. It was like a white device that you just could walk around and have your dialysis. Oh, that's cool. You know, uh, maybe this is simplistic. Uh, like Google deals in big data. I mean, that's their job. Big data. I mean, massive amounts of data. I would think if they want to get involved in healthcare, big data would be one of the first places they'd go. That's their business, is big data. I mean, all the data in the world, they try to handle. I mean, and, you know, healthcare is a drop in the bucket. <sighs> well, the, the big data that I hear about a lot, I write about neuroscience, and these big brain initiative projects where they're going to talk about collecting all the connections of a brain, all, all the activity maps of a you know, multitude of neurons, millions of neurons at a time. Uh, these guys are generating electron microscope slices, thousands of slices of tissue and, and uh, scanning it down to you know, just a couple micron resolutions. That's huge data. And I think nobody's really d approached anything of that scale that the neuroscientists have with the exception of maybe some particle physicists. Um, is the health field going to borrow some of that technology, do you think, or are they just going to come up with their own independent solutions? Well, you're, you're, I, think, I think you're a little ahead of us. Uh, so where we're going first is augmented reality, which is kind of the true promise of a lot of this technology, is being able to actually wear and have a, a, a heads-up display or what's called a, you know, an overlay for, for what you're doing, mm -hmm. along with assisted machines. So. So the ability to have a Da Vinci kind of robot and to have augmented reality in front of me, leverage, uh, you know, this has been 20 years in the making, you know, uh, the fuzzy logic in order to see patterns uh, on a display that the human eye doesn't recognize. But, the, but So there's two, there's two kinds of patterns, right? There, there's needle in a haystack, and computers are very good at those, and there's face in a crowd. Humans are way better at facing a crowd right now than, than computers. And that day is probably, you know, not, that's probably not going to last much longer. <laughs> but as far as the needle in the haystack, so when you're looking at all these veins and it's in real time, and there's a way that you could have a nurse wearing wearing like a heads up display uh, or using augmented reality, or you could train your surgeons, which is already being done at Stanford as well as Princeton, uh, using different kinds of augmented reality, so that you can look at a dummy and that dummy becomes a live person in front of you as you operate on them, and it, it's different kinds of ways of using augmented reality. Now tying in your big data. Right, uh, I think about five years ahead of us in terms of being able to leverage that in real time. But in terms of being able to do diagnosis and get away from, let's talk about some industries that are not very good for electronic health records, right? Urology, right? Oncology, okay? Dentistry. There's a lot of these fields that are are, are just just waiting for innovation because we have a lot. You know, you you, call, you pull together a panel of experts. Is this? Does everyone agree this is a grade three? Yeah. Right. But we can we, now we can collect information, at, and like you were saying, at such a high level, and we can learn so much more. We can get the genetic information, plus we can get the proteomic information. But we can have you know not just personalized health, right? But 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 uh, I'm you know super targeted personalized medicine. I mean, it's, we've come to a great place. It's just a matter of uh, avoiding those ethical issues that we talked about earlier. Yeah, it seems like a critical thing to keep in mind is particularly for say 23andMe data. As 23andMe brings on board more genes that they want to talk about and give you a potential warning sign, um, they have to be aware of the, the noise level increasing. In other words, it's not as reliable. All the, all the easy ones are already out there. You know, the APOE3 and, and the Parkinson's is fairly good science, I think. But then when they get into the softer stuff, you know, depression, alcoholism, whatnot, I just lose interest. You know, it's not very convincing. So I think it's important to you know grow the hard stuff faster than the soft stuff, and I don't I don't know how it's going to play out if it's going to be possible. Um, 23andMe seems to have 
gotten kind of quiet after the problems they had with the FDA a while ago. So I'm not sure what, what is really up with them. Gathering their forces, getting ready for another assault. Uh, you know, the, Chris, this is probably a question for another show, actually. Uh, do you think the HIPAA requirements need to be uh, updated for the digital age? <laughs> you think they're you think they're as outdated as some of that computer equipment you you were talking about? Two, I'm going to say two things on that topic, but you're right. That's a whole show. We could we could have a, in fact we could have a whole conference on just that. Right. Uh, HIPAA is updated few and far times in between. I was just in a conference today talking about very specific big data platforms. We were talking about in particular we were talking about Cassandra's implementation of Hadoop. We were talking about Squirrel's implementation of Accumulo. Um, these are things that, that very few people actually know, very technical concepts, right? Uh, uh, and then we're talking about platforms as a service and software as a service and cloud software. And then we began talking about compliance. <laughs> it's a, it, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, this is a serious topic, but it's a joke. Yeah. Yeah. Compliance with HIPAA is actually not that difficult. Right. And it is not keeping up with technology. It is nowhere near uh, where the breakneck speed, you know, speed that technology is in well, you know, I was surprised about that. I knew, I'm like most physicians, uh, uh, Chris, I know little about HIPAA. But uh, I, I was talking to an Indian programmer who was putting together a telepsychiatry uh, agency. And I asked him, uh, is it HIPAA compliant? And he says, yeah. I said, does it have to pass inspection or something? He says, no. But you have to be ready if they inspect you. <laughs> Not surprised. Yeah, so so it's it's kind of like you know some people are probably doing things and they're just crossing their fingers that they don't get inspected. Is it like that at hospitals too, where HIPAA inspections are very rare and you can kind of do a lot of stuff that that is not compliant? Is that or are they inspected frequently? Um, I I I would I I would categorically basically say categorically basically listen to me qualify this. Uh, let, let, let me put it this way. Um, there are healthcare systems doing way more than HIPAA requires. Good for them. They're applying GRC frameworks, okay. so security control questionnaires, audit the most risky programs. They're doing entire entire risk programs. They're elevating the role of chief security officer to be a peer with the other C-suite instead of just underneath the CIO. Because let's face it, security isn't just about technology. It's also about processes, right? Uh-huh. Uh, so when it comes to when it comes to the the, the, the technology, uh, there are community hospitals, unfortunately, you know, hospitals that don't have the funds, where um, their compliance is low. Okay. And, uh, they're just they don't have the they don't have SWAT teams going out there looking for for these violations. You can walk into some healthcare systems in this country, and you'll find uh, servers just kind of hidden underneath a physician's desk. Okay. You know, switches just kind of taped to the wall in a closet, um, and and that's part of, that's part of the challenge. You know, this is a grown you know healthcare. Uh, it's it's about money. It is a business. No matter how many nonprofit healthcare systems and for profit there are, it, 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 it is expensive to be compliant. And when it, when you bring in an auditor like you know like at Deloitte, right? And Price Waterhouse Coopers, you know, take your pick. Um, these firms do very good at peddling. Not peddling at, at, at identifying risky areas, but a lot of them identify more. They get into fear, uncertainty, and doubt, um, and sell contracts so that they can work on things that actually cannot be solved. So there's there's contractors that are just draining money from the healthcare system, uh, and we need to do a better job. We do we need to do a much better job of identifying exactly how to secure or harden what what we refer, we refer to as an, an accountable care organization or a payer provider. Yeah. You know, you know, uh, Chris. Uh, I mentioned to you, I think, uh, in an email, uh, that I saw one of your conferences, or symposiums, uh, when you were moderating, and uh, and a gentleman, not you, but a gentleman, said that 65% of healthcare costs are are designated just to maintain the status quo. Uh, could you just expand on that a little bit? What does that mean? In most industries, let's not talk about the operating budget. Let's talk about the IT budget. Okay. That's easier. In most industries, the IT budget is split 80-20, 80% 80 towards keeping the lights on and 20% towards doing more innovation or change-oriented projects, if you will. Uh, in healthcare, the average is between 90 and 95% for operations and 5% for the change-oriented projects. 
And remember, we're learning about DevOps. It's this new science where development is incentivized on change and operations is incentivized on stability. Well, there are loggerheads, right? So how do you incentivize development projects or change-based projects to create supportable environments? And how do you incentivize your support environment to feed back to change-oriented projects? How to do that? Well, the great thing about this new technology that's here and the frustrating thing frustrating part about regulations that are forcing healthcare systems to buy old technology, and most of them are old technologies, <clears throat> is, 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 is that they don't get to take advantage of the new technology. Cloud technology is actually, uh, today, can be very secure. Now, I would say in multi-tenant environments, there are situations where you can get in a cloud environment and you can, what's called hyperjacking, you can, hi you can hijack someone else's virtual machine or a hacker could do that and get access to your data. So there's all these scary stories out there. But it's way less common than someone breaking into your, your, your car and stealing a laptop, which we read about every month, right? right. Or all the records were exposed because someone uh, just opened the data center door. Right, right. It happens all the time. The physical breaches are way more common, right? So, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's a big challenge. So one comment. We, we have kind of an opportunity right now with, with Ebola. I mean, it's not going to go away anytime soon, and here we have a a big data situation where you have lots of questionable people that need to be tracked, uh, at least their position, their movements, their contacts, if not their temperatures and whatnot. Uh, so it's something, who is the right person if not the CDC or, or you know, a federal agency to do it? Um, how can the hospitals do it? And also, on the input side, you know, people coming in from the airports and uh, they're just holding an IR thermometry beam up to their forehead, which is, to my knowledge, unless you're spending $5,000 on it, it's not accurate. It's almost like a lie detector. Mm -hmm. You know, they might as well shine the thing on somebody's head and see if they get nervous. You know, and people we've even talked about looking for signs of people telling lies with, with facial scans and, and facial movements, let alone full-blown lie detectors. Just wondering, you know, if there'll be any attempt to bring big data immediately to the problem we have now of Ebola. So innovators are working on that right now. As a matter of fact, there's lots of apps coming out, and I don't know if they're leveraging big data. Like Ebola Near Me is an app you can download that shows you if anyone near you <laughs> actually has Ebola. Uh, there are definitely big data efforts uh, in terms of national intelligence agencies and the CDC. Uh, they're, they're attuned to trying to track these, these things. But tracking people is difficult. So let me ask, let me, let me, let me actually ask you, because uh, this is, this is, this, well, first let me make a statement and then ask you a question. The statement I have is that I, I believe that our global response to this, this Ebola outbreak is pathetic. We have had one person Ebola outbreaks in history, and there's no reason that this had to turn into an epidemic. So as a, as a global community, we completely failed, in, in my opinion. I'm on a soapbox of community, right? But let me ask you about, because you, you mentioned a way to track certain people, you know, the ones who have Ebola or who suspect have Ebola, or, you know, um, it feels a lot like not creating internment camps, because you're trying to create these, these, you're trying to get these people to not spread a disease, right? And so this is the zombie apocalypse, right? This is the, the response. They actually have a defense plan for the zombie apocalypse at, at the DOD, and they use it as an exemplar for if something like this were to happen. So let's use that, and let's say, well, what would happen? You don't want to go creating internment camps. No one in the world really wants that. Could you create, and I think this is where you're going, could you create like an ex-tournament camp where we were, were able to kind of give them like, like a wearable or something that monitored uh, clinical level telemetry, right, which exists. You know, there's, there's, there's these, these trackers that we wear that tell us how much we step, and then there's stuff you could put in your shoes that could tell you, uh, you know, a million data points per minute. Okay, it's, I'm exaggerating, it's hyperbole, but minute, let's say it's 6,000 data points per minute. On uh, things like, like, do you step on the front of your foot, the back of your foot? How is your gait? Are you favoring one leg or the other one? All this detailed information, same thing. You want more information about how you're feeling, about where you're going, about uh, your, you know, your temperature, um, all kinds of information we can do. Could you create a virtual internment camp where if somebody goes into uh, a public area, who we know has Ebola, we would almost have like a, a response where we'd go grab them and pull them out of that public area and say, what are you doing? You're endangering all these people. Stay away from these kids. Stay away from these other people. I don't, I don't know the solution to this. 
Uh, I'm a little scared of doing stuff like that. But um, I'm a sci-fi fan, so the, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the, the few, right, Spock? Yeah, I mean, just to take the example right now of the, the, the Ebola nurse from Maine, who they're calling, yeah. you know, they're, they're saying, uh, while well, they've noticed her car is at her boyfriend's, you know, what do you think about that? She's threatening to disobey the Maine quarantine issues. So right away, I mean, her and the Spencer guy, the other doctor, was on Uber and he wasn't supposed to be, you know, forgetting where he was or outright lying, who knows. So already the two major cases have already basically failed the quarantine procedures. So yeah, definitely I think we're going to need some some more active measures like you're mentioning. I mean, not, not criminal bracelets or anything, but, um, you know, if somebody has a pattern of, uh, or not a pattern of misuse or lying, but a stated goal to not follow quarantine, then certainly I think we should step in and at least ensure they follow the protocol for the 21 days or whatever. Yeah, you know, John, this topic is probably closer to home to uh, Chris than, than you realize, because yeah. I read that Chris was in West Africa setting up uh, internet. Uh, of, course, <laughs> of course, that's another another whole show, I think. Uh, Wait, the guys in suits are coming in. Hang on. Um, so yeah, did, did, you go to, did you go to West Africa and set up internet? Do you know that area of the world pretty well? That was in the 90s. <laughs> oh, they're not, but, but I guess, yeah. It probably, it probably hasn't changed that much, but now I guess they have more monitoring than they did back then. Because everything is iPhones and, you know, wireless over there. So they probably got a better handle on it today than they would have 20 years ago in, well, in, in, in West Africa. The other uh, thing, you mentioned a needle in a haystack type search problem. You could have a restaurant where if there is some question of, of Ebola or enterovirus or anything, your children or yourself, um, and you go, you want to go to a restaurant that is going to be declared Ebola-free by virtue of they're doing scans on every person that walks through the door. You know, it could be an advertising point. So it should turn things turn to the worse. So it's not keeping track of people, it's keeping track of your own place. Hmm. Well, That's interesting, because I mean, you could also make yourself a target. No, I'm, I would like to believe that no one would commit an act of evil, and <clears throat> I, would, I would suggest that if you know you have Ebola and you go into public that you are very close to committing, you pretty much are committing an act of evil. Even if in your own mind you're saying, I'm free, I have a right to do this, um, yeah. you know, it, it raises all these legal and ethical questions of morality. So I, well, in, in America now, if you have tuberculosis, you are, you know, legally uh, forced to go to the hospital to be quarantined. Uh, I guess it's kind of a similar situation, maybe. Uh, you have to be put in isolation until you you got a couple of clear sputums of tuberculosis. But it's so so rare, but but there are wards, especially in uh, jails. They have uh, people that are quarantined for tuberculosis for three days. They probably do the same thing for Ebola. Uh, you think you think that'll occur, Chris? Where people are kind of suspected, so they'll put them in quarantine. And that's that's where I was going earlier. Do, do we create internment camps? <laughs> are you? Maybe a house arrest option is much more likely because yeah. you can complain about being 21 days at an airport or 21 days in a hospital. Um, complaining about 21 days at home, you know, if, if you have a way of sanitizing the house and, and preparing it in such a manner that they get to be at home for 21 days and maybe, you know, it feels like house arrest, but it's for the good of the community. Once again, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Right. Well, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's the role of the CDC and the government, I guess. Well, well, we don't want to keep you too long, Chris. I know you're you're on the road right now, but appreciate you coming out. And hold on, we'll we'll talk after the broadcast is over. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, John, for coming by. And uh, good sure. night, good night, America, or good night, the world. <laughs> All right, bye. -bye.